We uh, didn't know we had that nice spiel, so we put our bios here. So this is Josh's. Does awesome stuff, right? We got mine. I do some stuff too, right? Good stuff. All right, so today we're going to talk about malware in um, Word documents, and we've had a couple presentations that are sort of related to this. So we had one talking about ransomware. We had one talking about the use of exploit kits. And we're going to talk here a little bit about the fact that it looks like exploit kits are sort of waning um, in the past few years. So we don't have as many people using exploit kits. Uh, part of this might be, as you saw the talk on exploit kits, they talk about this very complex structure that they have to use in order to get their exploit to run on somebody's machine. And they're having to use a, a variety of streams of either zero days, which are not very often, or basically unpatched um, vulnerabilities that they can use. So you have to keep getting new ones because as systems get uh, identified, right, they're going to get patched, and so then they're no longer going to have those um, vulnerabilities in them. So you've got to keep finding new ones so you can keep infecting clients. So you have to keep that up to date, and you're going to go after all of the, the big popular setups. So you're going to go after Flash, Silverlight, and Java. But if we've looked at in recent years, or we have less Flash, right? We have, if you look at Chrome, which we talked about, right? Chrome has its own built-in version of Flash, right? It has, we've got Silverlight, which is going away, and we've got Java, which has been de deprecated by all the different uh, major browsers. So we see those sort of going away as being useful. And so um, we al also, they have to use domain generate domain generation algorithms um, and they have to keep modifying these right because every time all of you out there that are going to have boxes that are going to get threat intelligence you're going to say okay these are the bad domains that you need to not go to so they have to generate more domains so that they can keep um, attacking people and then we've got URL redirects or the um, gateways that people go through DNS and then they're also util utilizing a whole bunch of compromised hosts so if you want to deliver this malware you have got to compromise some host in order to give that malware to people, right? So they would connect to, you know, Bob's, you know, diner or something, and that would have be hosting the malware so that you the person being infected would download it. So those are also going to get patched because people are going to notify them, hey, we see this, there's malware on your site, and so they're going to try and get them to be fixed. So what we've seen is that they've moved from using exploit kits to using social engineering and macros. So more and more we're getting emails that have this information in them that says, oh, here's a Word document that you need to open and it has information that is relevant to you. Right? So trying to trick the user. And training is hard. We have a really hard time getting users to not click them. I mean, it's, it's hard for me and Josh to imagine somebody s seeing an email and saying, oh, that's got macros, I should really enable that, right? And clicking the button to say, yeah, let's, let's run that macro, right? I do it all the time. Though. You're on a Mac, it doesn't matter, right? So, and, and the other thing is that users have jobs, right? Unlike us, right, they have jobs where they need to get stuff done. And to get stuff done, a lot of times they have documents that have macros that they need to run, right? Office is this standard that everybody uses. If you go to a corporation, they're gonna use Office. And so, People are going to use Office, and then Office has Visual Basic built into it, right? So you can run VBScript within that. And macros just work. So there are a lot of applications where people are actually doing work using Excel or using Word, and they're using macros within that so they can get their jobs done. And you know, so people are just used to this, and if they're used to hitting that Enable Macros button, right, and stuff works, then they're just going to keep doing that. So then what happens is you're going to have somebody who clicks on a macro and now you've got an attacker on your network and you have to deal with that. And we've seen some of the things they can deliver, right? They can do um, click jacking or they can do um, uh, the delivery of um, ransomware on, on people's computers. So we've got a lot of problems to deal with and so Josh is going to talk about more of the details on, on that. Yes. <clears throat> 
So my role today is to go through some of the more uh, technical techniques that they're using uh, to try to walk through those in PowerPoint the best I can. Um, I don't have a lot of demos. I have one video. We'll see how well we can actually see that. Uh, before we get into it, though, I did want to just <clears throat> make sure that I, I frame exactly what portion of this scenario we're talking about. We're starting with and really focusing on the Office document. We'll talk a lot of, about Word, but that could be Excel and PowerPoint, anything that could support macros, which I believe is the entirety of the Office suite. And then what happens after those macros are executed? And so as, as, you, as you probably know, in a lot of attack scenarios that involves malware, um, exploit kits, office documents, uh, a variety of others, there's usual se usually several stages. And so we're really just talking about this first stage, whether that's shell code or executables or um, VB script or PowerShell or some other OLE2 object that's been embedded in the document. Um, this is really the first two stages that we're talking about. Um, this stuff, that I have right now in the bracket, the job of that typically is to go to the cloud and to get another stage, whether that's more shell code, that's more PowerShell or scripts, or that's the actual malware itself. Uh, and then it drops and executes that or detonates that. So I'm not worried too much about that for this talk. We're gonna focus on the document, the macros, and some of those things that the macros are immediately doing. Um, as I said, focus is on the Office Suite. Focus today is primarily on the macros themselves and some of the behaviors that I've observed in the last few months, but it's not exclusive to. So we have seen uh, CV 2017-0199 just recently that came out, uh, required very little user interaction. The user did have to click an OK dialog in order to retrieve some content for a link. And then once that link was brought in, and I've got a little more details at the end of the, uh, the slide deck here if we have time, uh, then everything, the scripts parsed and, and everything was pretty much automated from there. Uh, social engineering, as we already talked about, embedded objects, uh, if a user just has to extract and double click something, then we're not really relying on macros in that case. So what are macros? Is everybody familiar with macros? Yeah. VBA, Visual Basic for Applications. Um, I guess I've had the benefit of not having to write any macros for a living, I just inspect the malicious ones. Um, but everything that comes with macros is pretty well documented on MSDN. So if you look for VBA, you'll find a lot of resources there on MSDN, the Microsoft Developer Network. Um, of course, there are features that malware authors are gonna use that aren't as uh, necessarily documented. And, and one of those, one that we're seeing very prevalent right now, is the use of the Windows API. And we'll go through an example here. So malware that uses inside of the macros, maybe a call to virtual alloc from kernel 32 in order to allocate memory and stage into that memory some shell code. So um, there's probably one of the first things that I do when inspecting a malicious document, and, and even before I get into that, uh, just to help, again, kind of gauge the level of detail that I go into these, um, oftentimes there are easier, easier methods. If I just want to see what an office document is reaching out to or the files that it's dropping, I can just execute it in a sandbox or a VM and collect those artifacts when it's done. If I want to find out actually what those macros are doing, if there's new techniques that it's using, then, then I go a little bit deeper. So one of the first things that I do when I look at trying to determine uh, an office document, if, if it has macros or not, because that usually then drives the direction that I go for the next step in my analysis. Uh, the first thing is probably OLE dump, and I'm assuming everybody's heard of, has everybody heard of OLE dump from, from Didier Stevens? It's a Python script. It, it helps us to dump content and information about an office document, particularly to see the streams and the resources in that file. We're gonna go through all of those here um, just real brief in a moment. Another method is, of course, just to open the document and see what happens. If it asks me to enable content, then I know that it's trying to execute macros. And I can also use the IDE that's built into the Office Suite. So anybody that develops macros, whether for malicious or non-malicious purposes, they can also open up basically like a Visual Studio type editor in order to build the project that, that associates those macros with that document, edit them, debug them, and everything. And so I can actually use those. You can use those as well in order to help with your analysis. So, as I said, probably the first one that I go to is OLE dump. I had an opportunity to meet Didier last week. It's very nice. Um, this is what the output from the tool will look like. It's, again, it's a Python script, so I, you're going to be running it from a command.exe or a terminal. And you'll see that it lists a bunch of information. The first bit is the index, so that just helps us to get a frame of reference for the different streams that we're talking about. 
probably one of the more important pieces of information right now of all these indexes, of all these resources in this Office document, what actually contains macros. And the little M will indicate that that stream contains macros. So now I can usually narrow my search down, my research down to just those streams. So you can see in this screenshot, um, 8, 10, and 12 have macros. Now you'll also notice that there's an uppercase and a lowercase m. And what that is discriminating against is streams that are macro definitions and streams that actually contain macro code. So the ones with the uppercase M are the ones that actually contain code. The other ones are just defining a class or a, a, a module. And so typically we don't need to worry about those. That's the size of the stream. And I point that out because every once in a while uh, you'll find maybe some embedded content in a stream and it'll have a very abnormally large size. And so it might be worth taking some time and dumping that stream and inspecting that to see what's inside of it. You'll see an example today. Uh, I guess I kind of got lucky in that you'll recognize some patterns and you can, you can dump an executable from the stream from there and you'll see that in a moment. My favorite macros are all called Cowkeeper <coughs> and Discord. So you can see those are the stream names. Um, another indication that we're dealing with something slightly off or maybe malicious is that the obfuscation efforts that the authors will go through will oftentimes include the name of the stream. So you'll get random looking stream names such as Cowkeeper and Discord. Does anybody know what those streams represent? The ones that I have highlighted in yellow. It's not a trick question, I guarantee. It took me forever to figure that out. Um, those, that actually means that on this document, there's a user form. And the reason that that's important is because I'm seeing right now a lot of shell code being stuffed into the user form. So then that shell code will be pulled out, deobfuscated, put into memory, and executed. So we'll go through a whole example here with that in just a minute. So when I see F and zero, I see those streams right there. I know that if I look at this inside of an IDE, or if I trace into this when I dump the macros, likely there is a user form with some sort of an object on it, a text box or a label or a bunch of tabs or something that probably has some content stuffed inside of it. Here's an example of if we ran the command, OLE dump, we tell it what stream we want. So stream eight, dash S and then eight. Dash V decodes the stream. If you don't give it that argument, and of course if you do the help file, it'll tell you all about this, um, then it doesn't decompress it or, or deobfuscate it. There's, Microsoft has some way of, of storing those macros inside of the document without being it in plain text. Uh, the name of the document, you can say I use the hash, so it's a little bit long, and then I just redirect that to a document, a file in my file system, so that I can go ahead and interact with that document, maybe do some refactoring, um, or other things that help with my analysis. Once I'm done, I have something like this, and now again, we can start digging through those macros and inspecting those to see what they're actually up to. Before we do that, I said we can also enable the office ID, at least I'll call it an ID, um, you'll have to navigate into the options. You can go into where you customize the ribbon, at least that's the way that I do it, and I enable that developer tab, which isn't available by default. And then once that's enabled, you can see that we have the option on the, on the very left-hand side there to click Visual Basic. And what that will do is that will open up your project. So if the maldoc contains macros and they're not password protected, then you'll be able to see all of those streams just like we could with OLE dump. The added benefit then to the IDE is that we'll also be able to see the user form and we can debug if we want to as well. So we can actually set breakpoints and step through this code. And uh, it can make analysis, I think, a little bit easier. There's our project. There's one stream of macros. This document, that's like the default. Most maldocs will have the this document macros. A lot of them decide to stuff the auto open. You can actually see that in the screenshot. That's that function down at the bottom. Um, so when the document is opened, that's the function that originally triggers the execution of the macros. So the entry point into the macro code. Um, this document tends to have that, but it's not, it does not have to be defined inside of the this document macro stream. There's another one. So this has an additional stream, uh, Solemnize. Again, kind of a strange name, but that's just due to the way that these malware authors are obfuscating not only the code inside, but also the names of the modules. There's our form. Again, another very strange name, uh, Chinking, I guess would be how I'd pronounce that. Um, we can double click on that form and then you'll, you'll see that. And we'll, you'll have, I have a slide here in just a moment that'll walk us through that. Um, you won't see 
when we looked back at the OLE dump, you didn't see information that directly correlates the user form to that object, that user form object that we see in the IDE. Uh, and I don't know if there's a way with OLE dump to get that information out. I haven't come across it. So oftentimes the only way I know is by seeing that F and that zero in those streams that there's a user form. Now when you're looking through the macros, again, you'll probably need to get into this actual user form and look at the different objects on it and see what those are called in order to tell when data in that user form is actually being directly referenced. Okay, as I mentioned, now you can debug. So pretty standard source level debugger. I find the place in the code that I want to set a breakpoint. I click in the margin, it turns red, and then I can go ahead and press play. And from there, execution should begin. Now again, just like any debugging scenario, you have to make sure that your malware will actually get to whatever path you're trying to get where you set that breakpoint. In this case, I set it on auto open, so I'm pretty confident that I'm gonna start right there. Uh, but if I'm further along in the macros, I just have to make sure that the logic will in fact get me there. Otherwise, of course, your breakpoint will never be set. Once you're in debug mode, you have all your standard debugging options. Step in, step out, step over, stop debugging. We can also do uh, inspect the values of variables, you know, our memory inspection. And you can see here that uh, what happened is I just got really tired of looking at all these obfuscated macros. I wanted to see the value of a couple of strings. So I set a breakpoint, and now I added watches, as you can see in the dialog below, to see what the values of those strings were. So instead of tracing through those backwards and figuring out how all of the obfuscation was done in order to build those strings, uh, I just set a breakpoint and looked here. Sometimes I encounter passwords. Sometimes I can get around them. Uh, sometimes I haven't. I've had luck with, uh, I think it was a spreadsheet was the last time that uh, I was able to find a, an offset or a key value pair in the file just using a hex editor and replace a value, open it up, and then actually replace the password. Uh, and a newer Word doc, I haven't been able to find that same offset in the file and bypass that. So I've had situations where I've had an Office document that not only requires a password to view, but a password to view the macros. They're not the same password and I couldn't figure out a way around it. I didn't really want to take the time to figure that way out, and so I just had to observe the document from the outside. So using tools like Procmon or Wireshark in order to see the artifacts that it leaves behind or the, the communication that it's performing. It was touched on uh, the presentation here earlier this afternoon. Macro protections by default are to disable but notify. So of course we give by default our users the ability to still enable and execute those macros. So uh, it's still a bit of a problem. Social engineering abounds. Uh, we could go through just social engineering examples all afternoon if we didn't get extremely bored. Uh, but the gist of it is that they're just trying to get the user to, to enable that content. So here you see something that's saying, hey, this is the latest version of Word and you're not up to date in order to see this content. Um, you have to actually enable content. Um, we actually saw this example or a very similar example to this earlier this afternoon as well and that this one was a slightly more targeted, at least it appeared slightly more targeted and that it had the name of the individual recipient. Um, it had an attached document and then it had a password. So they had to, once they opened the document, they had to provide that password to get into it and then from there they had to enable content um, in order to actually get the, the macros to execute. And this is one of my favorites. It was part of a, a UPS phishing campaign and that the email said that uh, UPS had tried to deliver something to you, they missed, and I've attached conveniently your tracking number in a Word document that contained macros. And so then once you open that Word document, you see that it's encrypted, and the only way you can decrypt that is to enable that content. Okay, as I said, forms. So if we were to double click that form, just so you can see it from the view of the IDE, you can see it from the view of OLE dump, the two, my two primary tools when looking at maldocs. Um, that would be the form itself then. So again, you're not gonna see the name directly in the dump from OLE dump. Um, looking at the form itself, it might seem unimpressive, but oftentimes all you have to do is adjust the size of the canvas or that window, and then content might emerge. In this case, uh, it was fairly obvious that something was out of place here when the content of that text field started with the 45A. Um, not quite that straightforward though, because it, they, the malware authors did do a little bit of obfuscation with that embedded executable, um, and we'll talk about that here in, in just a moment. Now, when you select that, that text box, you can also look at the properties of it. 
So you can see that I have uh, two more screenshots there in the lower right, and that top one is the name of that field, transducer. So when you're looking in the macros, if all of a sudden you see reference to an object, in this case transducer, uh, that's how we're tying together the fact that it's using a form, and more specifically, it's using the content from that form uh, within the macro logic. So if you're really trying to trace through it, that's how you would eventually be able to tie those two together. So I left this slide in in order to talk. It's very similar to the one that we just looked at, except that when we look at dumping this stream, so the screenshot to the right, um, what we're doing there is actually, it's stream 15, which you can see from the OLE dump in the center. And what stood out from that initially, not just the fact that it's part of a user form, was also the size. It was a very large size stream. When I extracted the content, looked at the content, and again, you can use that same basic command, OLE dump dash S in the stream, then these bytes went flying by, and I immediately recognized the 45A. You'll notice that there are some bytes in front and there are some bytes behind if we were to look at the stream its entirety. And those are just bytes that are related to how this is actually stored in the user form. So there's some things that if I were to extract this, if I wanted to get this executable out manually, I'd have to trim those leading and trailing bytes. Um, the other problem is that even though I've recognized that there is the 45A, which is the magic number for a PE file, MZ, that's the, the byte values for the ASCII characters MZ, which stands for Mark Zuckerberg, right? No. <laughs> no. He didn't create PE file? Oh, shoot. Um, the problem is, though, that uh, this is an ASCII dump. And so if I'm looking at a PE file, the ASCII representation of it, I should be seeing MZ and not 45A. I should be seeing the DOS stub. This program cannot be run in DOS mode, and I'm not seeing that. And so what the malware authors did for this particular example was they took the original byte value, and then they wrote into that field the ASCII character for it. So that's why you're seeing four, and then D, and then five, and then A. And when they eventually drop this to disk and execute, they go through each ASCII character, and then they write it again as a byte value. So they convert it back to binary. So if I was scanning this with a tool, I probably wouldn't catch it, because it wouldn't match the signatures, the patterns here for a PE file. Um, but it's just really easy to, to, to dump, to basically um, swap those bytes back, dump and execute. So it didn't take much logic within the macros to actually do that. Everybody loves obfuscation, right? I know I do. Um, obfuscation comes in a variety of forms. Uh, where we're dealing with source code, uh, we have you know, source level. This is VBA, so it has to at some point be executable, um, and it has to be valid syntax in the language. So we see a variety of things, a variety of techniques that are, are, are somewhat trivial, but they're nonetheless very, they're very time consuming to get past them. So you can see with this one, um, the function names and the variable names are one. They just use completely random and ambiguous names, um, such as our, our parakeet object. Another favorite, and this is obfuscation that you see in more than just, of course, VBA, is to use a lot of string concatenation. So breaking up strings and then uh, concatenating them later together, um, taking a string and doing a reverse of it, or maybe doing a substring of it. You see that a lot, too. Moving past that string, so down to lines five, six, seven, you can see there's a lot of very simple mathematical operations, some addition, some subtraction, and there's even a for loop after that. And again, more than likely, all of that is just junk instructions. They're just there to slow us down as we're trying to analyze. So the more you see, the more you can pick that out, the quicker then, if you really want to spend time on these macros, and any code that's obfuscated, you could delete that and then just be left with the stuff that is actually important. So you might get macros that are 500 lines of macro code, but if you refactored it all down, you might only have 50 lines or something because it's just so full of bloat such as that. Okay, I mentioned the use of the Windows API. Here you can see an example from the, I believe, the Hanseter Mal campaign. And what they're doing is essentially declaring pointers to APIs within whatever module they want to load. So you'll see if user 32 and kernel 32 on uh, a handful. What they additionally do is they throw in some song lyrics. So I chose this one because I, um, there's a Led Zeppelin line in there, so I thought that was appropriate. Um, for no other reason than I like Led Zeppelin. Um, now, because they use things like, again, names that mean absolutely nothing. If we look at the last one, for example, because we're actually going to follow this one because it's responsible for executing some shell code here. 
Um, Cabriolet, that's how I'm gonna pronounce it anyway, is an alias for enum date formats W. So if I wanna see where that API is now used in the, in the actual macros, I have to be able to follow that variable name or, or refactor it so I know where it's being called. Um, the other thing that might be surprising, any guesses as to this, one of these functions is gonna be responsible for executing shellcode. Anybody wanna guess which one? Register class, okay. Anybody wanna bet with him or against him? All right, we'll find out then in a minute. Yeah, we found out right now. <laughs> we'll come back, we're gonna go through this one in detail. Um, but there's the API call, it's Cabriolet, and this is actually the one responsible for executing shellcode. So we're gonna step all through that here in just a moment. So using a an API that's maybe not directly obvious as to the, the purpose of it. So a few of these slides, I put the actual samples up. So if you get a copy of the slide deck or you wanna follow along or something, there's the sample that we're about to look at and just a brief snippet on virus total because I needed to fill the slide up with something. So as promised, we're back to Cabriolet. If you remember, that was uh, format, date, string, something. We'll see it here again in just a moment. And one of the things that I decided to do when analyzing this particular document was instead of tracing through the code, I just set a breakpoint to see what was happening when these APIs were being called. In particular, when I found that Cabriolet was being called, and I knew what API it was, I was interested in how it was being used. So I set a breakpoint. If we look up that function on MSDN, we'll see that it is documented. It's not one of those strange undocumented APIs that malware authors like to use. And the first argument is actually a pointer to an application-defined callback function. So that's how it's attaining the execution of shellcode. So you'll see in just a minute, it's actually allocating a chunk of memory, putting shellcode there, and then using this function with a pointer to that shellcode in order to achieve execution. So I, to me, it wasn't obvious that that's what they were gonna do until I stepped through it and figured out that that first argument was a callback and really a pointer to, a, or a function address so we can inspect that first variable, look at the value, convert it to hex. We'll see that in this particular run, right, it was, it was allocated through, I believe, virtual alloc, um, so the, the address could change. Uh, in this case, though, it was 70D0E5D. If I use a tool, I like to use Process Hacker in order to look at memory for the processes. You'll see that uh, there happens to be the base of that allocation, 70D0000, and it also happens to be read, write, and execute. So a likely target for shellcode. And what happens when that function is called? Well, it's gonna go right to here. And I don't know about you, but my favorite opcode is 55 hex because that's a push EBP, so it looks like it's landing in the function prolog um, of some shellcode. So that's how it achieved that execution. Now the technique, and again, we'll talk about this right now, is process hollowing. And what this shellcode is doing then is it is going to start a process in a suspended state. Um, it's gonna use an executable that's already on disk on the system. So typically SVC host or explorer.exe, it's gonna suspend it, so it's gonna get loaded into memory, but suspended, kinda of like when we load a program with a debugger right before we, you know, we let the debugger break in before it begins executing. And then it hollows out the main code and replaces with, with its code. Once it's done with that replacement, then it resumes the thread, resumes the process, and the malicious code is now executing. So it, doesn't necessarily have to write anything to disk. It extracts that shell code out of the document, loads an executable already on disk, replaces it, and then um, that shell code is, is now executing. Yes? Is that a binary ninja? For it is binary ninja, yes. Do you have a lot of stores like that in your day-to-day -day analysis? Um, I'm trying to, yes. So I, use, I still use a lot of IDA. Uh, that's my, my go-to, my crutch. Um, and I'm using binary ninja more and more. Uh, to, to just to get a feel for the tool, especially as they're developing it and, and things are getting much better. So, you use Binary Ninja? A little bit, yeah. A little bit, okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool, cool. I have to admit, I know Jordan, the developer, so. <laughs> I'm not gonna push it too hard. Yeah. It's a great tool, though. Um, it looks pretty, right? And it looks pretty, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't have it in the demo, but you can do this thing on a keyboard where you do Command Z and, and it undoes errors instead of, yeah, I know, it's <laughs> amazing. Um, oh, anyway, so here's the shell code. 
So you know, if we wanted to continue to trace the, the behavior here, we'd have to dump the shellcode from memory. And our analysis from the Word document into this, this blob of memory that has the shellcode is helpful because it tells us at what offset to start disassembly. So if we just take a bunch of bytes and we pull them out of memory, um, we can't always just tell a disassembler to start at byte one, offset zero, and begin to disassemble. So we saw that address before that function called the cabriolet, so we could see here where to go and begin disassembly. Um, this is actually a different shell code, so you'll see the offset if you're, if you're really paying attention. The offset's just a little bit different, but the concept's very similar. Um, shell code's a whole other beast. We have uh, a lot more anti-analysis type tricks inside of here. Uh, if we were to dig into those, we'll see a lot of dynamic API resolution. So it's going to load, it's going to find a base address for some module, not through some exploitation, but taking advantage of things like the process environment block and the, 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 the linked list structure that it has in order to um, locate where those addresses are, those, those modules are in memory. Um, get a base address, find some APIs, and then load other modules like kernel32 or user32 or others as it's needed. Um, so you'll see a lot of things like a call and a D word and some um, you know, offset relative to EBP or ESP or just some global D word address or something. It's indirect and we don't know what it is unless we step through the code or figure out how it's dynamically resolving. So we might have to do quite a bit more reversing in the shell code if we want to continue to trace it. What's that? I use a tool called Process Hacker. Oh, Process Hacker. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think I have a good. This is this is the only screenshot I have for Process Hacker, and so. No, that was um, when I when I when you get the properties of any process, it'll come up with that that window that has all the tabs. There's a memory tab. And the memory tab will have all the addresses for any memory that the process is using. And then, yep, and then I expanded that. So I saw the allocation at that address. I expanded it, right click and save. I was in WinDebug at this point in time as well. So you could just dump from WinDebug. Supposedly, I haven't gotten that to work yet either. Uh, right mem is supposed to work. Here's an example, the highlight on the bottom. Uh, I renamed that variable, so using tools like BN and IDA allows us to rename those labels, which is very, very helpful. Otherwise, I just would have seen a call to a D word, EBP minus some offset, so I don't know what that call is, but because I was able to figure that out and rename it, I can see it's create process. Looking back then up that, that call, the, the pushes, setting up the call stack, the arguments for that function call, um, if we looked up create process on MSDN, we'd see the sixth argument is the process creation flags, and Microsoft defines what all those values can be, and a value of four in hex is suspended. So that's one of the, the telltales here that we're looking at the beginning of the process hollowing technique. These are the other APIs involved. Get thread context, that gets information about a structure about the thread. And ultimately what it's gonna do, you'll see set thread context there right before resume thread on that list of calls, is it's gonna be able to update where, when that thread resumes, what address of entry point essentially is there. So it's gonna know where, when that thread resumes, the CPO is gonna know where to, where to begin execution. Um, unmap view a section. We'll take that section from SVC host or explore or whatever process just got hollowed. It'll actually take that code section, unmap it out of memory, and then write process memory in conjunction with something like a virtual alloc will then allow you to allocate memory and then move your shell code or whatever you wanna get executed into that space. Set the thread context and then resume the thread. I don't know if this is gonna come through all that well, but kinda of hard to see, isn't it? Well, anyways, if you, if you watch the process activity here, you'll just see that once I enable the content, we'll see an instance of SVC host start and begin execution, and that was the entire process hollowing technique in this document. If we hover over or inspect that process, you can see the path, C Windows, SysWow, 64, SVC host. So it looks like it was started from that location when in fact it wasn't. Uh, well, it was, it was loaded from there, but the, the code was hollowed out. All right, moving right along. Some PowerShell. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I always put my author block as PowerShell dash window hidden dash encode and then some base 64 string whenever I, whenever I author a, <laughs> an office document. Um, so this one has some PowerShell, and this is one of many ways I've seen PowerShell utilized in an attack. Um, 
This is also kind of interesting because it has some error handling for a Mac shell, and uh, Matt will talk about that here in a moment. We still had to have macros in order to get that content and execute it. So you can see there are usually a handful of objects that you commonly see, wscript.shell and adodb to write to the file system, and XML HTTP to do stuff with the internet and HTTP. Um, so there's our object, it's created, and then it used the content of that author field to execute as the script. Um, that script was a base64 encoded string, and that's gonna be the dash ENC is gonna decode that, and then it's gonna be executed. Uh, this is a multiple stage PowerShell, and so what it did was it took all of this first bit of content here, I know it's really hard to read, but it treated it as a string, it base64 encoded it, and then it used PowerShell, another instance of PowerShell, to execute that. The second stage is the more interesting one, because we have in this stage a bunch of shell code at the beginning, and then it used, there's our shell code, it used virtual alloc and then memset to copy the shell code into memory, and then it used create thread in order to execute that shell code. So once it was staged in memory, then the address that we had from virtual alloc from that allocation in that X variable was used as the, uh, the place to start when that thread was created. So it used PowerShell to eventually get to the execution of the shell code. Uh, at this time, when I analyzed this, it was dead. I tried to make a request out to that IP for that resource, and I got a 404, so I, didn't, I wasn't able to go any further. Okay, VB scripts, one I just encountered. Um, this one opened it up, and it had this, um, these OLE objects embedded here. At first glance, they look like they're additional Word documents. Uh, of course, they're not. They're VB scripts. All three objects are the same, so if a user were to double click on them, essentially what they're doing is they're asking for Windows to handle the execution of these VB scripts. Um, all three are identical, ran the hashes on them, they were all the same, so open them up, and you'll see that, uh, again, we're dealing with a ton of obfuscation, so uh, it's up to you, I guess, as to how you want to tackle that. Um, I just did some dynamic analysis because I really didn't feel like deobfuscating all this VB. Um, oftentimes, though, if I wanted to start trying to digest all this obfuscated code, I look for things like this dot open property. So I look for properties that they just can't obfuscate or it's very difficult to obfuscate on objects. And a dot open probably means that it's making a request that's using maybe an XML HTTP object to do that. And so that, if I'm interested in how it's, you know, the domains or something that it's using, I might start there and, uh, and sifting through all that junk. I didn't do that, I said. Uh, I used Procmon and Wireshark to just capture some basic information. This thing dropped two files, a .rms file and a .jdc. This was the .rms. Any guesses on what they did to this file? This was the initial file dropped from the VB script. The 73 is what stood out to me. They just did a simple XOR. So they XORed the original executable with a hex value of 73, and that's what came across your network. Um, once it was dropped on the file system, then the VB script went through it byte by byte, XORed with 73, and then you got the executable. Right, so if you took maybe that first value, 3E, and XORed it with 73, you get 4D. Um, otherwise, you see all the 73s, that's because they XORed zero with 73, which is 73. So uh, that's how I picked up on that. There's the file. There it is on virus total. So the document itself wasn't on VT yet, but um, the, the files that it drops are. Looks like it's a, a Trojan. Uh, that one was kind of odd because when I tried to run it, I got a bunch of errors. So I didn't have a lot of time to debug it, but it just something seemed off with it. Uh, the last sample that I'm gonna talk about was one that I just thought was interesting. It utilizes cert util in order to decode. So again, we're seeing a very common pattern in that we have some sort of usually trivial obfuscation or encoding scheme in order to get the actual payload across the network, through the internet, whatever, um, and then something that is used on, that's already on the host, whether that's the scripts that have been dropped or the office document, or in this case, the cert utility that's within Microsoft, within Windows, in order to do the deobfuscation or the decoding. So that's just a link to the cert util on MSDN. With this file, um, I can't remember now offhand if it drops the PFX or if it actually gets it from the internet, uh, but this is the first file that's actually written to disk in the unfolding of this Office document. And this is what you'll see it do. It uses the cert util dash decode and then the location of that PFX file. So it's just base64 encoded. So it decodes it, it writes it as an executable in your temp directory, 
and, and then it executes it. Yeah, CV 2017-0199. I don't have much to say about that. I don't know if anybody has any questions. It's patched now, so uh, it's much mitigated, I think, at this point. Shall I turn it over? Yeah. All right. All right, so some of us, Josh and I included, uh, like to run on our OS 10 boxes. So we're not uh, alone, although if you look at the market share for Mac, right, it's not very big in comparison to people running um, Windows. So we don't... We don't have as uh, much malware that is on there, but again, if you look at the top line on there, you can see that it's that uh, the way Microsoft built the VB right on the Mac, it still can load binary libraries. So this one is loading libc dynamic library in order to go ahead and run a bash shell there, right? And then it uses the uh, you can use the system command, um, which is loaded. Um, actually, this one, the newest version of the Mac. Um, Office update will not run this one anymore because they've changed it now to 64-bit. And so if you, that one doesn't run, then of course there's a new one, right, that runs. So this is the um, one that runs both, right? So it checks to see is it on a Mac or is it on Windows so they can sort of hit both at the same time. And they either run the, so we saw previously Josh showed you the author field uh, as one of them. Oh, I use, I don't know how to use the latest one. There we go. So we use the author field in order to uh, get the PowerShell code that was going to be executed. So that's if you're on Windows, and then if you're not on Windows, then it goes ahead and is going to use um, create a shell script that's using Python, and it'll um, and this one basically creates a reverse shell um, on a system using slash bin slash sh, and then using the Mac script library, we'll go ahead and run and execute that code. So. Again, we, we have the full power of, of what we had, but you know, we're, we're stuck within a uh, sandbox on OS 10, so they do, do that a little bit better. So um, you have to get, basically get an escape. You can open any application, but writing to the disk is a lot more difficult on OS 10 on the, the newest updates with Microsoft Word. So I guess we got time for questions or comments. Yep. I don't do any attribution, no. no. <laughs> I'm usually just interested in, in functionality. Um, consulting, I work for Bromium, uh, and it's usually just just what actually occurred here, not necessarily where it came from. So and attribution's like, hard anyway, so. It is an exceedingly hard <laughs> So I don't think I really wanna <laughs> even try. <laughs> and second question, have you run across any of these that actually do detection to determine if they're in a sandbox, and then change the I, I do. I have a blog post on the Bromium website. <laughs> I should have included that. I didn't. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, I don't remember all the details now off the top of my head, but it was using, I think, WMI to query. It was actually doing a variety of things, but one of the ones that I remember uh, was, I think it was using WMI to get the process list and then look for, you know, your telltale processes that were running virtualization, VBox, and QEMU, and a couple others, so. Off the top of your head, how often do you say you run into Um, I don't look at these things in mass, so I'm not someone that looks at, you know, 50 word docs a day. Uh, in the last year, though, that was the only one that I've encountered. That, yes. and then this one here, that last Mac, or that last uh, one that we looked at that actually targeted both, I, I don't typically see that either. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of these techniques right now are sort of in their infancy, so they're not doing a lot of checking, but as people sort of get more aware, they're going to, right, increase that. And that's... He showed earlier the password one, right? So the entire reason you have a password on that document that the user has to type in is that auto analysis isn't going to be able to run on that and determine, oh yeah, as soon as it enables macros, right, then we have something that runs. So that stops that auto analysis right off the bat. So you, you know, have to have the analysis, figure out what the password is, and then fill that in in order to run it. So we're in a cat and mouse situation. Yeah, as, as usual, right? I mean, it's just going to escalate as we, as we start. Stopping PowerShell, right? They're gonna they're gonna try and use more advanced techniques after that. So, so yep. back on that oh. 
Yeah. Uh, I didn't with that script. Um, I guess I, I typically don't look at the metadata, the author and, and stuff. If you run file, usually you can see that kind of information. Uh, there's some other tools. Um, so that's no more than just running like it's actually yeah. parsing. It's actually parsing those the word documents in their their binary format and figuring out all the different sections and then presenting that to you and letting you. Well, it's the new docx formats are more complex than the old ones, so they're it's it's fully parsing all of that information. Yeah. So, um, Drydeck seems to be a big one right now. Um, I think the, the process hollowing one we looked at earlier was Drydex. It was dropping Drydex. Um, you know, just, just Trojans. Uh, I, I don't know if I can say that there's a specific type. I, I don't see a lot of ransomware coming out of office stocks right now, but that just could be because of the ones I tend to look at. That they tend to be more of the Trojan, the Drydex, the things that are trying to get a, a stealthy persistence on that host. So like your No. Yeah, that, that was an actual maldoc. Um, that, that that was a little bit of I think some of your code, but the, yeah, I modified it so but I the, the could document test it. was that's that was really the actual code within that maldoc that was distributed. And, and again, I don't remember exactly where I got that sample now. Um, it looked to me like proof of concept code. If you looked at even the comments, it's, it had they had comments in it like. Try your wind shell, and if this fails, then we'll jump down here and we'll try the Mac shell. And that, that Mac shell was, was pretty simplistic in what it was mm -hmm. trying to do. So, uh, but it was distributed. So I don't know if the malware authors were, there was a trial run or an oops, or a, they thought it was production ready. I don't know. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your guys' time.